Good evening, friends. Thanks, everybody, for coming. This is our October Astronomy on Tap, Los Angeles. Uh, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a computational astrophysicist here at Caltech. I will be one of your MCs for tonight. Our other MC is Dr. Kaylin Henderson. Kaylin, you want to pop in? Hey, so Kaylin is a staff scientist at IPAC, which is a, a NASA center on Caltech's campus. So, um, Let's see, if this is your first time, our schedule for tonight is, uh, traditionally these are events held in a bar in Old Town Pasadena is where we tend to hold ours, but uh, we aren't able to do that since the pandemic. So we're doing this virtually, but there's still, there's still beer drinking for, for us and perhaps for you as well. Although no pressure on that front. Um, the schedule for tonight is after we kind of ramble around for a couple of minutes with announcements, we will um, we'll introduce our speakers and we'll have two 15 minute talks. So a 15 minute talk by first Briley Lewis, a PhD student at UCLA um, about Pluto. Welcome Briley. And then um, a Q and A period after that. And then another talk by Chris Bohenick, a PhD student at Caltech on fast radio bursts. Chris is here, excellent. And then a Q&A after that. And then we'll do pub trivia, which is quite interactive actually, uh, despite the, the weird YouTube streaming aspect of this. So there is a website that you'll be able to go to and we'll ask the question and you can click on the, on the website and say your answer and then it'll pop up on our side that everyone can see and everyone can see what everyone else is, is, is answering and we'll have a pretty good idea how, how well our audience is doing answering the questions and such. So it's, it's really fun and I encourage you to participate in that, but that'll probably be the second half around 8.30 in an hour or so. Um, let's see, other quick announcements. The, yeah, we do these events once a month. Our next one, isn't quite a month from now because if it were a month, it'd be on Thanksgiving or it'd be the, the, the week of Thanksgiving, which is not obviously ideal. Hopefully everyone will be doing something else on their Thanksgiving then. Well, I mean, I'll probably be drinking beer and talking about astronomy, but I realize that's not everybody's piece of or cup cupcake. I don't know what the turn of phrase is for that. I, think that's, like that. I think that's actually it. Yeah. A, a piece of cupcake. It's not yeah. everyone's piece of cupcake. And then, um, we also have a sister series of events at Caltech uh, called the Stargazing Lecture Series that happen once a month on a Friday night. They're a little bit more formal. It's a 30 minute talk by some scientist at Caltech about their research and followed by a, a hour and a half or so long Q&A uh, between both the, the speaker on their, their subject matter, as well as a couple of other specialists in different areas of astronomy answering questions from the audience on whatever topics the, the, the questions that you guys have. And our speaker for that, uh, so that's in a week and a half, a week from this Friday, November 6th. Uh, our speaker for that is a, is a pretty famous astronomer, actually. Uh, her name is Dr. Katie Bauman. She was in the news a couple of years ago for uh, contributing to a really important result, which was the first image taken of a black hole with the Event Horizon Telescope Consortium. So she she's now a professor at Caltech and she'll be giving that talk. So it's super exciting. Um, and yeah, you can save all your black hole questions for then, which will be super fun. And let's see, what else? Uh, how, are, how are you guys doing? Enough of me just yapping. How's everybody doing? Briley, Chris, Kaylin. Life is good. Life is good. Uh, I'm excited for how life will feel in eight days and a few hours. Yeah. Yeah, I like your I voted sticker. Very good, Kaylin. Good work. Yeah, friends in LA County, if you want to come up to the Altadena Senior Center Friday, Monday, or Tuesday, you can hand your ballot directly to me. I'll be working the election. Uh, make yeah. sure you vote regardless of where you turn it in, though. Just yeah. that you do. I will also be a poll worker at uh, at Victory Park in Pasadena. So so stop on by and drop in your ballot, um, or yeah, however you vote. But it's important to vote regardless. So please, regardless of your stance on anything, uh, make sure to educate yourself and and uh, and turn in your vote and be counted and be represented. 
Um, let's see. Oh yeah, let's, I, I wanted to announce before we get the talk started, uh, there was the big moon announcement today that everyone probably uh, heard about and at some level. Um, the NASA made an announcement because there were two papers, uh, research papers that came out today uh, in Nature Astronomy regarding uh, water on the moon. So one of the papers was an observational paper done by uh, an astronomer named Casey Honeyball. She was the, the, the primary author on this. She's a postdoc at Goddard, I think. And she and team used the SOFIA telescope, which is a crazy telescope I'll get to in a second, uh, the SOFIA telescope to find the signal of water on the daytime side of of the moon. And it's not like there's a lake hanging out or a puddle or something like that. This is more that the water is, is um, trapped in some capacity like in, in glasses or in between grains. Um, so we don't exactly know yet how to extract that water, but there's water on the day side of the moon, which is pretty exciting. And it's something that's been suggested from previous studies, but this is really a confirmation of it. So it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, the other study was more of a theoretical study showing that reanalysis of some of the observational data sets indicate that ice traps. So when you, at, at the polar regions of the moon, because the sun, uh, what's a good example? If this is my, if this is my moon and this is my sun hitting it, um, there are regions in the, the, the north and south polar region that regardless of the rotation of this, they just never get sunlight. And so they remain really, really cold because it's, yeah, because they're, they're never getting direct sunlight and there's no atmosphere to kind of redistribute heat on the surface like there is here on earth. And if water should get into those craters that are permanently shadowed, it just stays there. It freezes and it locks up and it never moves there and it'll stay there for like a billion years. And essentially the result of this, or this, this new paper that came out uh, suggests that the size of those craters can be much smaller than we previously thought, like on the order of centimeters and still be effective at trapping ice there. And it kind of increases the overall amount of ice that could be trapped in these permanently shadowed craters, which is pretty exciting. Um, anyway. I, I was pretty excited. I know it's being lauded as this big thing, like, oh, it's gonna make it so it's easier to go back to the moon for astronauts and build permanent installations. That's probably true. It's not like we've got it all figured out. There's still a lot of cool stuff that needs to be done, but um, but it's exciting. It could. Uh, I was, as you say, uh, over the moon about the news. Over the moon. Nice. It's nice. a very nice result. Very nice. Yes. Um, and then, what's that? Well said. Well said. <laughs> the other thing that has been, and you guys should feel free to jump in. The other <laughs> thing that um, I feel like is kind of important astronomy news uh, that's been kind of through the grapevine is there was a paper put out, maybe a couple papers put out in the last week or two. You guys remember the the phosphine detection in the mm -hmm. in the atmosphere of Venus, and everyone was like, "Oh, it might be life." I mean. It's probably not life, but everyone, it's, there's a possibility that it's life. Uh, but there, there have been a couple of additional papers put out that's, that suggest that the fitting of that detection of that absorption feature that was ind indicative of this phosphine and phosphine could be a biosignature. It may be that, that that detection isn't quite accurate. It might be a, an artifact of the fitting method for the spectra and essentially I'm gonna jump into jargon here for those in the know. Uh, they used a high order polynomial to fit the background of the spectrum. And that's not usually a very good thing to do because it can, it can cre create some of these artificial artifacts that aren't real. And then someone fit that and was like, oh, look, it's right where we expect phosphine. And it, it might not be real. So, but this is how science is done. You know, you put out, you put out a result uh, with your analysis and your conclusions. And then another group scrutinizes that and says, ah, uh, 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 you didn't account for this thing. And you're like, oh, shoot, I didn't. And then maybe in the end, with enough eyes on this, hopefully you'll get closer to an accurate representation of what is happening in nature and, and in the universe. And so, yeah, this is how science goes. But 
Yeah, it's, I think so. Last last month, I think I quoted you know our, our friend and colleague of the program, Jesse Christensen, who said, you know, if my options are unknown biology, unknown geology, and unknown chemistry, I'm going to pick unknown biology last every time. The the most important rule, uh, and and all people who are graduate students or scientists out there know this, is that actually probably I'll take you know improper data reduction or right. artifacts <laughs> above all of the other scientific explanations. But as Cameron says, this is how it's done. This is how it's done. Yeah, so um, am I the only one who's drinking anything tonight? I'm drinking to, to celebrate the moon news. I'm drinking some H2O yet. Okay, excellent, excellent. I've joined Kaylin. He's drinking kombucha. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, water, water, insulated water, very nice, very nice. Are there any other news, space news or astronomy news that you guys want to chime in about? I was trying to think of other things, but. There's, there's some big news that we'll get to in the, uh, in the trivia. But we oh can, yeah. We can save oh, yeah. that as kind of a, you know, a surprise at the end. Okay. I'm so intrigued. <laughs> very intriguing. Excellent. Um, okay, so. I would like, if, if that's, oh, and one last thing, if, if you're really into astronomy on tap, uh, there, are, there are many astronomy on tap chapters across the globe. I think there's on the order of like 40 or 50 different chapters in different cities. And one silver lining, one silver lining to the global pandemic forcing us to shutter our events is that many of them are online like ours. And so instead of having to be in New York City to attend the Astronomy on Tap in New York City or be in uh, Austin, Texas to attend theirs, you can watch them all online. So I encourage people who are excited about this to check out astronomyontap.org that lists all of the active events that are going on and, and check out some of the other great, great events. And as part of that, Briley is involved in a group of students and postdocs and faculty, but mostly graduate students, who are launching an astronomy on tap through UCLA on the west side of Los Angeles um, to our, our foil here in Pasadena on the north side of Los Angeles. So people in Westwood and uh, the region around Westwood on the west side of Los Angeles, when the pandemic eventually breaks, will we'll be able to attend events closer to home and it's going to be awesome. So I'm really excited about that, Briley. Thank you for, for providing that to the public. Um, I'll put a link in our YouTube description, but they are on Twitter at, is it astronomy on tap AOT West it's LA? AOT West LA. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I would say they are, they're more of our compliment than our foil. Okay. All right. I was just looking for. A... Hey, we're all on the same team. We're all on the same team. Okay. So um, I would like to introduce Briley as our speaker for tonight. Briley Lewis is an astronomy graduate student at UCLA, currently working on creating new data processing techniques to directly image exoplanets. Uh, previously, though, she did research on Pluto with New Horizons, which is, of course, the topic of her talk tonight. She's also one of the coordinators for the UCLA Planetarium, the organizing chair of ComSciCon Los Angeles, and a writer for Astrobytes, which is a super awesome website that kind of uh, summarizes major astronomical papers uh, at the level of like an undergraduate, something like that. So, But definitely appropriate for a lot of our, our audience members tonight. Outside of work, she spends her free time making science art for her Etsy store and playing with her rescue dog, Rocky. And uh, along with that, uh, she has some pretty awesome earrings on here that you said you, you made those and they're of Pluto? Yeah, exactly. That's pretty awesome. Do, oh, you, do you sell those? I keep those getting lost in the Etsy Zoom site? screen. <laughs> Um, these are actually the only pair I've made of these so far. I made them for myself so I could give talks about Pluto, but I'm thinking of making more soon because they're really fun. Yeah. They're made with those, you know, those plasticky beads that like people used as a kid where you melt them together. That's what these are made of. That's awesome. I may have to pierce my ears if I get a, a pair of those, <laughs> so excellent. Okay, well, I'll leave it to you. Do you want to sh uh, share your screen, Briley? Yep. All right. 
There's always a little bit of lag, isn't there? No worries. There we go. We Looks should be great. all good now. That's great. All right. Thanks. Awesome. Cool. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me at Astronomy on Tap, not West LA, even though I am here in West LA at UCLA. Um, and like Cameron said, we're going to have AOT West LA starting soon. Um, there's a really awesome group of grad students at UCLA who have been working really hard on putting this together. Um, I'm super excited about it. Other before we get started, apologies in advance if there is some dog barking. Uh, when I'm not paying attention to Rocky and talking to someone else, he gets very offended and thinks I should be talking to him. So I've got my emergency dog treat just in case I need to distract him, but let's hope that he's a good boy today. So today we're going to be talking about Pluto. So a lot of the planets, you know, we've just, we've known about them for a long time since you can see them with the naked eye. Um, but Pluto is extremely tiny um, and extremely faint because it's so far out in the outer solar system. And so not that long ago, um, a man named Clyde Tombaugh actually found Pluto in the 1930s um, by looking at these images um, taken at a telescope in Arizona. So you can see the arrows in these photos are pointing to a little dot that has moved over the course of six months. And that little dot is Pluto. So the reason that they could tell that this was a planet and not just a star is because it was moving so fast across the sky. It had to be closer to us. But all we knew about it was that it was that little tiny dot. This seems a far cry from photos of Pluto that you know I used to make my earrings. So how did we get here? Um, so astronomers eventually got to use the Hubble Space Telescope to get a better look at Pluto. But even with HST, the super powerful telescope that got us the picture of galaxies in my background, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, this is the best that it could see of Pluto. Um, still pretty much just a dot. So even though we could discover some of the moons and resolve these bright and dark spots on the surface, astronomers didn't really know what to expect from Pluto. It was a Kuiper Belt object, something different than we had visited with space probes before, like the Voyagers didn't go past it. So that's why we sent New Horizons, was to get a better look at Pluto to better understand the Kuiper Belt, which is just all of the icy stuff that's out beyond the orbit of Neptune. So once we had New Horizons, we got the beautiful pictures that we all now have seen, um, where you've got Pluto's wonderful heart shape, um, and this dark band across the center and all of these different features. So Pluto is this really interesting object and we're gonna talk about it more. But first, a little bit about New Horizons itself. So New Horizons is the spacecraft that showed us so much about Pluto. It was launched in 2006 um, and took almost 10 years to get to Pluto. The flyby was in 2015. And this was the first mission to go to Pluto and the Kuiper Belt traveled over 3.4 million miles um, to get to Pluto. And it's actually still out there and going further away from us. It's past a second hypermold object now that we'll talk about too. So New Horizons had seven different instruments on it to take pictures, to count the dust that's out there in the solar system, um, to measure the atmosphere of Pluto and more. And because it was so far away, it took 16 months to transmit all the data from the flu Pluto flyby back to Earth. So even though the flyby was in 2018, we didn't get all of the data until 2016, end of 2016. Um, so that's a, a pretty slow connection there. It's also amazing that we could get pictures of this high quality from 3.4 million miles away. Pluto had quite a journey to get there. So it was launched in 06 and had to cross a bunch of different orbits and do flybys to gain speed throughout the solar system until it finally got to its closest approach to Pluto on, the, on July 14th, 2015. But that's not it. So it's been five years, where is it now? This is the full trajectory of horizons where you see it slingshotted out of the solar system. It was actually one of the fastest craft that we've sent out. Um, it passed Pluto. It also passed this object called Arakoth or MU69, which we'll talk about. And now it's still going flying further away from us uh, towards the outer, outer solar system, and it's just gonna keep going. And we'll keep getting data as long as the instruments are working, which is cool, just kind of like the Voyagers. So what did we actually learn 
from New Horizons. It took pictures, but what did they what did they show us? Pluto also had a spectrograph to uh, understand the composition of Pluto. So what is it made of? Turns out Pluto is basically a giant snowball. So it's made of ice. The bedrock of Pluto is water ice because at the really extreme cold temperatures, negative 380 degrees Fahrenheit um, of the surface, water ice is stable, just gonna be ice. Um, but there are other volatiles on top or things that at those temperatures can go between solid and gas. And those are like snows on the top of this water ice bedrock. You've got water ice covered in nitrogen ice, carbon monoxide ice, and more. So Pluto's just ice. Makes sense considering it's so cold out there. But it means you've got mountains of ice and lakes ice and all these cool things that we'll see later. Another question, does Pluto have an atmosphere? We wouldn't necessarily expect one on something that tiny, but the answer is yes, it does. And so the pictures that I'm going to show you are all real images from the New Horizons mission. So this was taken looking back at Pluto after New Horizons had flown by. So it was back illuminated by the sun. And you can see that there are all of these different layers of the atmosphere. Um, these are actually like layers of haze, like cloudy things. Um, and although Pluto's atmosphere is way, way less than Earth, it's only one one hundred thousandth times um, the pressure. It still has these really cool haze layers and it's neat to be able to see that that means the surface here is active and there's all this stuff going on on Pluto. It's this dynamic world. So these 20 defined layers of hazy particles are scattering light um, and showing these, this definition that's so interesting. All right, that was the atmosphere. What about the surface? What's Pluto's surface like? So we're gonna go through a bunch of different features and I'm gonna compare them to ones on Earth. At first, you're gonna be like, I know what this is, but just wait until the end. So first off, Pluto has craters. So this one right here um, is a really defined crater on its surface. And if we zoom in, you can see these very nicely defined photos. So New Horizons got down to resolutions of a couple um, miles per pixel on the surface, which is incredible, um, considering this is an object millions of miles away that we were flying by at kilometers per second and we still got photos like this. So it makes sense that Pluto has craters because most things in the solar system do. They're just from the little debris that's in the solar system hitting the surface. So Pluto has craters and we have craters on Earth too. So this is a Behring crater in Arizona, um, one of the best preserved craters on our planet. Pluto also has mountain ranges. So these are not mountains made through tectonics like we see, like we think of on Earth. Um, they're actually made, they were made of ice like everything else on the surface. So if you zoom in, you can see these mountain ranges that are like these chunks of water ice floating on other ices, um, making these long mountain ranges around the heart shape. And of course on Earth, we have mountains too. Pluto also has what they call fossa, um, which are pretty much giant canyons. So a zoom in shows these, they look sort of like pictures of Mars, um, where it's just these cracks along the surface. And an Earth analog would be, you know, a canyon. And then Pluto even has possible lakes. So if you zoom in here, there's a couple of features in Pluto that people are, that geologists are still working on. Um, but this, looks like a lake. So it might be a frozen lake of some sort of ice. And of course on Earth, we have lakes. So now here's the one that's gonna make you understand why I was doing all those comparisons because this one is weird. So Pluto has this stuff on, on this limb of it called the bladed terrain. Oh, I just gave away the punchline. So the bladed terrain is this really weird geologic thing that it took geologists a while to figure out what this might be on Pluto. But an Earth analog for this are these things called penitentes. So they're pretty much these large deposits of spiky ice um, that happen in these just, I think these are in the, these are from, uh, I want to say South America. Um, yes. Yeah. So these are in Argentina. Yeah. These are in Argentina. Um, there's a couple of places, but I was trying to remember where these exact pictures are from. So penitentes are found in place Argentina. And this is, 
pretty much what geologists think the bladed terrain here on Pluto is, which is really neat. These are very strange geologic formations. So the thing that you've all probably heard about before this is the heart shape. So Pluto has craters and lakes and mountains and all these things, but what is the heart? Like, why does it actually have a heart? There's two sides to the heart. Um, the more defined left half is Sputnik Planitia, uh, and the more defined, the less defined right half is what we call Tomba Regio. And so these contain all sorts of geology, like glaciers and convection cells and more. And on the edge of Sputnik Planitia is where mountains we looked at are. Um, but what Sputnik Planitia, the left side of the heart, actually is, is just a giant impact crater that has been filled with nitrogen ice. So if you look closer at it, you can see all these convection cells from where this nitrogen ice is flowing and returning. Um, so it's really just a, a giant frozen reservoir um, that contains most of the nitrogen that's on Pluto's surface. All right, so that's about Pluto. What about, does it have a moon? Um, it actually has five moons. So this is Charon, Pluto's largest companion. Um, got a giant crack along the center um, and a dark spot on top that I'm not gonna give away the name yet because it's actually one of our trivia questions. So Charon is Pluto's largest moon and it's actually one of the reasons, it's the reason that astronomers sometimes refer to Pluto as a binary planet. So Charon is almost the size of Pluto, which is really unheard of. If you think of our moon, it's much, much smaller than the Earth. Um, so sometimes people say Pluto is a binary planet for this reason. It's also got a bunch of smaller moons, um, Nix, Hydra, Kerberos, and Styx. So you can see Nix was actually observed by New Horizons and so was Hydra, um, but Kerberos and Styx weren't really visible just because of the orbital arrangement at the time. And they're pretty much just little lumpy potatoes. They're captured KBOs, most likely. Um, and speaking of KBOs, what was what was that Erikoth thing that was in the flight path? I said we'd come back to it, but what is it? So if we see it's the thing that Pluto that Pluto visited, that New Horizons visited after Pluto. And it's an, another object in the Kuiper Belt. So it is the first KBO other than Pluto to be imaged in this much detail. And I'm super bummed because my GIF isn't playing now because it was supposed to show you the zoom in as it goes, as New Horizons approached. MU69. So New Horizon flew past within 3,500 kilometers and captured features that were down to a couple hundred feet across. That's really high resolution. And it turns out that MU69 pretty much looks like two potatoes stuck together. And this weird formation actually tells us a lot about the earlier history of the solar system and how things like this formed. So to recap, Pluto is super interesting and has a lot going on on the surface. And it's made of mostly ice. It's part of the Kuiper Belt, which is a collection of icy debris beyond the orbit of Neptune. And it's almost 5 billion miles away. It's not a planet, but that's okay. It's still, we still like it. It's still interesting. And it's still being studied, and we have so much more to learn about it. Like, papers are still being published on the New Horizons data very regularly um, because there was so much to find out about this little dwarf planet in that data set. So thank you. I would love to answer some questions. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter for uh, more science, but honestly, during the pandemic, more likely dog pictures and science craft. Um, that's how I'm insane. And then, like I said before, uh, follow AOT West LA to see more Astronomy on Tap events coming up on the west side for everyone in Santa Monica, Westwood, Culver City, this half of town. And that's it for me. Awesome. Bravo. Thank you. Great, great talk, Riley. Thank you. Those penitentes are intense. Yeah. They're uh, very strange. They are very strange. Okay. So we have some questions in the cat the, the chat. I encourage people to ask their questions in the chat if they want them asked of Briley. Um, so one question is what place should be visited by our next large mission, Uranus, Neptune, Europa, or Enceladus, mm -hmm. or, or Pluto? All right, so, I mean, we already are planning missions to Europa, like Europa Clipper, um, but 
if I had my way, I would do an ice giants mission to Uranus and Neptune just because we haven't, you know, gotten to really get close up information on them since the Voyagers out. They would be really interesting for exoplanet science too, um, because there are, we think so many of these mini Neptune sized planets out there. Um, so having, knowing more about Neptune in order to like apply that knowledge to exoplanets would be really cool. And also might as well just know more about the two planets we know the least about so far. Absolutely, absolutely agreed. Um, there is a question here. What did you focus on um, as part of the New Horizons team when you were? Working? Yeah, that's a fun question. So I worked with data about the composition of the surface mostly um, and some modeling to sort of understand how Pluto's surface was going to change with these seasons. Um, one of the, I think, most interesting things that I found that's actually in a paper I published earlier this year is that um, I actually did some calculations to show that most of the nitrogen on Pluto's surface is in that harsh in Sputnik Planitia. So Pluto is, Pluto's surface is mostly made of nitrogen. We've known this for a while because of spectroscopy, even we couldn't resolve the whole, um, you know, disk of the not a planet. Um, but yeah, now that we have higher resolution data, I basically traced all of the nitrogen on the surface and found out that most of it should be in that crater. Oh, interesting. Why, mm -hmm. why in particular there? Is it because it's revealing something about the subsurface and there's more nitrogen below the surface? It's or? because it's just so deep. Um, so it's this really deep crater and nitrogen ice accumulates in low places on Pluto. So mm -hmm. over many, many, many years, it's just had time to accumulate a ton of nitrogen. So mm -hmm. the volume of that is just, you know, Enormous. it's basically a big like cold trap where it oh. gets colder, the more nitrogen that goes onto it, and then it's colder, so more nitrogen, so a feedback loop. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Um, there are more questions. I have a, I have a really quick question. Is there anything in particular that the presence of Charon as its major moon has like the coevolution of those two makes it unique relative to the other planets in the solar system or other planets in mm. other solar systems? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know that much about Charon, to be honest. Um, okay. Like the extent of that data I've seen is like the picture that I show this talk. Um, I, I would love to read more on it, but I haven't really done any research with it. Like, even though I was modeling seasons, I was modeling them on a time scale that was like way shorter than you would think Sharon would have an effect. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I, people have I, haven't, on that. I haven't thought much about it, but it seems like the coevolution of a, of kind of a binary planetary system mm -hmm. would be much different than a traditional yeah. kind of, I, you know, isolated planet, but yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Okay, um, other quest questions. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about Pluto's axial tilt and how it affects its seasons? So this is kind of weird because Pluto is also on this like really inclined orbit. So talking about the axial tilt uh, gets, you know, kind of messy because with all of the other planets in the solar system, we're basically, you know, on the same plane, like we're orbiting in the same plane around the sun. So axial tilts relevant to that are all really comparable. Like you can say, oh yeah, we're tilted this much and some tilted this much. So you can compare how much sun, like how much sunlight you're getting at each angle. But Pluto is not in the same plane. Its entire orbit is like this. So the axial tilt isn't even the biggest factor. <laughs> and it's also really eccentric. Um, so most of the planets in the solar system are close to circles, but Pluto is more stretched out ellipse. So it's got a bunch of different factors that contribute to its season. So it actually has what we call super seasons. So its climate cycles are much more convoluted than like the seasons here on earth. Interesting, okay. So sort of like uh, the in a planet. In, uh, 
in Game of Thrones. <laughs> oh, I didn't watch Game of Thrones. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> one of just one of the things that has confounded viewers with Game of or readers even of Game of Thrones is that there are uh irregular length seasons like winter can be a few like a winter like a typical earth-based winter of a few months or it can be like a decade and it's unclear there's some sort of chaotic uh variability in terms of seasonal variations and yeah I, I think somebody wrote a paper on april fool's day that tried to explain the details of what could be responsible for this irregular duration of these seasons. <laughs> not to not to tangent too far away, but yeah, there are a couple of papers. They looked at like, you know, maybe it has a, a a flaring host star, maybe it has a short precession time scale. But but there was another paper that talked about some of the same things that you talked about, Riley. You know, having a very inclined orbit yeah. depending on what the axial tilt is, kind of etc. So. No. Yeah, I don't think George R. R. Martin was really, I mean, there's also magic and zombies. So I don't think he was really <laughs> trying to hew to the, to the level of scientific uh, established fact with his, with his stories. Um, anyway, uh, I think those are the, the, there was one question, how, so one question from, uh, that's how detailed would, would images of exoplanets that we would see by 2030? And I think Maybe this is in reference to the uh, New Horizons continuing to pass outward into the mm. outer solar system. Um, yeah. I think that's the question. Or really. New Horizons is not the one that's going to be doing exoplanet imaging for us. Like that's just, it's, that, it's not it. It has to be close for its images. If you look at the images of Pluto on approach, it was still pretty close and they are blurry. This is not a distant telescope. <laughs> um, yeah. Kayla, I know, actually would have a lot of the a lot of the future exoplanet knowledge. Um, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. So in, in the twenty, in the, in the very, very early twenty thirties, um, there'll be a chronographic instrument on uh, the somewhat recently renamed Roman Space Telescope, um, and it will try to directly image planets, uh, maybe down to the mass of Earth. Uh, but it's going to be nothing like the the resolution that we have of of this iconic heart shaped image for Pluto. Um, and then there's a whole new slew of, of missions being proposed um, that would that would be active in, in kind of the middle of the 2030s. Um, mm -hmm. For those who heard the acronyms like LUVAR and HABEX, um, and, and those have, they're still under different design spec kind of models, but they have different aperture, basically the size of your telescope mirror uh, uh, designs that would allow for kind of pretty good or, or even really good images of exoplanets. But it would even, you know, using those in conjunction with the star shade is not gonna be kind of what, what we see as Pluto. Um, yeah, and as, as Briley says, the, the New Horizons instrument will, uh, will not quite do the job, not to mention the time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And like the directly planets that I work with now with like ground-based telescopes, they're not pretty like this. They're basically <laughs> dots. <laughs> um, one last question. And that is, um, so is it possible that Pluto might be a captured object or do we think that it was formed at the same time as the rest of the solar system? Um, I'm guessing they mean like captured object is in from beyond the solar system. Um, yeah, I think. The answer is same. most likely no. Um, it probably formed with the rest of the Kuiper belt out there. So it, it makes sense where it is. Like there's a lot of icy Pluto-like things out there. It's just the biggest one. Like that's part of why we don't call Pluto a planet anymore. We call it a dwarf planet because it hasn't cleared its orbit. It's living out there in the Kuiper belt with all sorts of other icy objects made of similar things to Pluto, um, like MU69. Excellent. OK, great. Well, thank you very much, Briley. Thanks for having me. Briley, we'll, we'll, we'll stick on for the rest of the, the, the discussions and such as well. but. Um, now I think it's time for our other speaker. Chris, do you want to come back on? Sure. All right. I'll let you take it away, Kaylin. Hello, hello. So, so welcome, Chris. Uh, everybody, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our second of two speakers today. Uh, this is Chris Bohenik. He is a graduate student extraordinaire in radio astronomy at Caltech. Uh, he is looking for postdocs uh, currently. So if any of you happen to have a few extra positions lying around, you know, please let us know. Uh, he 
Chris built a network of radio antenna called STAIR2 that was designed for finding fast radio bursts in the Milky Way. On uh, outside of science, he enjoys cooking and baking. Uh, and today he's gonna tell us uh, about fast radio bursts. Um, I don't know if he'll talk as much about cooking and baking, but thank you very much uh, for donating your time in the middle of a postdoc job application season, Chris. We really appreciate it. And uh, as a reminder to the folks out there, I saw some chatter in the chat. Feel free to type questions throughout the talk um, or you can save them to the end as well. And then, and then as we did with Briley, I'll moderate them um, and hand them off to Chris. So thanks again and take it away. Yeah, well, thank you for the introduction. I'm um, excited to be here. So I wanted to talk today about a phenomenon called fast radio bursts, uh, which are a pretty mysterious thing uh, as we don't really know what they are, although I will talk about how we've made tremendous progress in the last few months about figuring out what exactly a fast radio burst is. Um, yeah, so I'll get right into it. Uh, and our story begins at this telescope, which is located in Australia. And uh, and a scientist uh, called Duncan Lorimer uh, was using this telescope and he was observing this galaxy on the left here, which is the Small Magellanic Cloud, uh, which is one of the satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. Uh, so it's pretty close by. And he's looking at this uh, galaxy for uh, radio pulsars, uh, which are uh, neutron stars uh, spinning that emit pulses of radio waves at very precise periods, which are whole interesting objects and which are very interesting objects and uh, very much worthy of time on this great telescope over here. Uh, but what he found was much more interesting than a pulsar in the small Magellanic cloud. Uh, so he was observing uh, this area of the sky marked by these circles over here. And right in this circle here, uh, he found this. And what this is, is a fast radio burst. Uh, so you can see uh, the radio frequency on the y-axis here. And these frequencies are about twice as small as the radio waves that heat your food in the microwave. Or not, this frequency, yeah, these, this is about half the frequency of the radio waves that heat your food in the microwave. And on the x-axis here, we have uh, the amount of time that has passed in milliseconds. And you can see, this sweep here, which is our fast radio burst. And you can also see that the high frequency emission or more energetic emission uh, arrives at the telescope before the low frequency emission. And the fact that the sweep is so long is exactly why this pulse is much more interesting than a pulsar. And here's why. Uh, so uh, what causes this sweep in radio emission uh, is when a radio burst travels through uh, ionized gas, it undergoes something called dispersion. So you can see the high frequencies here represented in purple and the low frequencies in red. Um, and when they travel through ionized gas, the, it's, the high frequency emission actually travels faster than the low frequency emission, uh, causing uh, yeah, causing the radio waves at high frequency to uh, arrive at our telescopes first and our low frequency radio waves to arrive second. Right, and they hit Australia uh, for this burst. Um, and the time delay between the high frequency emission and the low frequency emission is basically a counter of the number of electrons between the source of the radio burst and us. And if you count up all the electrons between the source of the radio burst and us, you find that you need many, many more electrons uh, than are between us and the small Magellanic cloud, meaning that this radio burst likely came from an incredibly far distance. And because it came from uh, such a far distance, that means it's also incredibly energetic, which would make it much more interesting. Um, and uh, we had detected one event, uh, but from one event, we can learn a lot. Uh, so because you need many more electrons uh, to explain this 
uh, fast radio burst than are between us and the uh, galactic halo. Uh, it's likely coming from a distant galaxy. And in five milliseconds, this radio, whatever's producing this probably emitted as much energy as the sun does in one day. Uh, so we're dealing with very energetic phenomenon. And because it's so small and information can't travel faster than the speed of light, we know that uh, whatever produced this radio burst is smaller than the distance between Pasadena, California and Denver, Colorado. So we're dealing with something that's much, much more energetic than uh, the sun and stars, uh, but it's also much smaller than the earth in the size of a city. So that's a pretty extreme object. And based off of how long uh, we've been observing and uh, not finding these fast radio bursts, there's uh, a few thousand of these events that are detectable every day, but we're just looking at the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, but of course, uh, as Cameron mentioned earlier, when presented with new astrophysical phenomenon, boring uh, thing we already know about that is a bit strange and weird way, and uh, the data analysis is wrong, you start with the data analysis is wrong. Uh, so at this point in time in 2007, this could have been uh, just a man-made signal. Like we can't tell if it's actually astrophysical from the data, although the dispersion sweep is very suggestive. Um, and it could also be uh, in an unknown dense environment in our own galaxy. So there's just a lot of electrons bunched up somewhere that's not in our models of how many electrons are in the galaxy. Uh, so nobody really pays attention to it until 2013. Uh, so between 2007 and 2013, everybody's kind of like, oh, it's probably just man-made stuff. Uh, but then they find four more. Uh, and now is the field uh, kind of starts to take off and people start taking notice. Uh, but they were also found with the same telescope, uh, which is in Australia. Uh, so it could still be something terrestrial and just a bit weird with the observatory. We don't really know what the Australians are doing down there. So uh, we'll be a bit skeptical still. Uh, but then a uh, fast radio burst was observed in Puerto Rico. So this is not an Australian phenomenon. Uh, this also happens in Puerto Rico, uh, which gives a bit more credibility, uh, but we still can't really, we still can't really tell that it's uh, not a galactic thing. Um, yeah, we can't really tell if it's a galactic thing and maybe it's just some weird atmospheric phenomenon. Uh, so you can see the, the atmosphere from Puerto Rico and from Australia. But then uh, this fast radio burst that was found in Puerto Rico was found that it's not just one time, uh, it goes off uh, many times. And here you can see 11 bursts from the same source. And we know it's the same source because it's in roughly the same place in the sky and there's the same number of electrons between us and the source. Uh, and because it repeats, we can point a different kind of telescope, which you can see over here, which is able to pinpoint uh, fast radio bursts very precisely on the sky. So we can go look at other wavelengths of light and find out what's there. And when we look uh, where this fast radio burst is, it's at this X here. On top of it is a dwarf galaxy. And not only is it in a dwarf galaxy, it's in a star forming region inside of that dwarf galaxy. So it's definitely astrophysical and ex definitely extra galactic. So we ruled out the uh, man-made thing, no big deal to boring thing we already know about that's a bit different. And now we actually have arrived at exciting new thing that we can uh, exploit and learn more about. Um, and the big question is what is doing this? Uh, so between then, we start building a bunch of telescopes specifically to look for these fast radio bursts, and they're able to pinpoint more fast radio bursts to host galaxies. And in particular, I want you to pay attention to this one, which is a spiral galaxy, and the fast radio burst is located in the spiral arms of this galaxy. Uh, but at this point, we found uh, fast radio bursts in a wide variety of galaxies. Uh, so for a long time, there were more theories about what made fast radio bursts than fast radio bursts themselves. And here's a little summary of just some of the things that have been proposed to produce uh, fast radio bursts, which include 
uh, supernovae, merging black holes, uh, gamma ray bursts, uh, or, and even uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, although nobody really took that much too seriously because uh, in the order of things, bad data analysis or something uh, completely boring to thing we already kind of know about, but is a bit more interesting uh, to new phenomenon. Uh, there's a whole nother bunch of steps you have to go through before you get to aliens. Um, so, but a lot of these things can't really explain why uh, things repeat. Uh, so black holes merge once and that's it, and you'll probably never see it again. Uh, but fast radio, we know that there are fast radio bursts that produce many bursts. Uh, so those are a bit less plausible. Uh, but I want to focus on this magnetar hypothesis uh, that has been popular for a long time. Um, uh, as to what is a fast radio burst. Um, and uh, magnetar is a type of neutron star with uh, incredibly strong magnetic fields. In fact, they're the most magnetic things that we know about in the universe. Um, you can see an artist's rendition of them here. And these loops here represent the magnetic fields. Uh, and they probably aren't uniform. They probably have some pretty weird patterns as are uh, shown here. And uh, how big a magnetar is, uh, this is like a two scale representation of a neutron star, which is a magnetar, of which magnetar is a type of neutron star, compared with the city of New York. So this thing would definitely fit between Pasadena and Denver, uh, which was one of our criteria which could emit this thing. And they're not going away, so you can get multiple bursts throughout the lifetime of a magnetar. Some other fun magnetar facts is that it's basically a giant ball of neutrons. Uh, so in matter, most of the space is taken up by uh, the space between electrons and the atomic nuclei are much smaller. But a neutron star is basically, what if we could just get rid of all this space that electrons take up? and just make stuff out of neutron stars. Um, and that's incredibly dense as one teaspoon of this type of matter is about a thousand pyramids of Giza um, to give you a sense for how dense this is. And the, I mentioned before that the magnetic fields of magnetars are ridiculously strong and they're so strong that they alter the atomic structure of stuff inside of the field, of its field. So normally you would think of like, uh, an electron cloud around a atomic nucleus to be uh, roughly, roughly kind of spherical, uh, but inside of a magnetar's magnetic field, they're squished into pencil-like shapes uh, because the magnetic field influences their structure so much. And these magnetic fields uh, power a wide variety of high energy astrophysical phenomenon when the shear caused by the uh, magnetic stresses on the magnetar crust uh, crack can actually crack the surface and create a star quake, uh, which means that we see some x-rays here on Earth. And every decade or so, one of one magnetar in the galaxy um, will be so strong as to entirely break the magnetic field, causing it to release a huge amount of energy and snap back uh, into a more stable configuration. Uh, and if we were within 10 light years or so of one of these giant flares from a magnetar, the Earth's atmosphere would be in trouble. But luckily, there's no magnetar within 10 parsecs. So we're OK. Um, so I want to talk about um, a galactic an event that a story that starts in on April 27th of this year, uh, which is the detection of a galactic fast radio burst. And on April 27th, the forest of these X-ray bursts created from the cracking of the crust on a magnetar uh, was reported from a galactic magnetar, SGR J1935 plus 2154. Uh, so everybody goes and points their telescope at this thing as it's doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, and on April 28th of this year, the very next day, 
uh, two different uh, telescopes see a incredibly bright radio burst uh, from this magnetar SGRJ 1935 plus 2154. One of them is a set of 420 by 100 meter telescopes called CHIME. Uh, and they, it was so strong for them that it lit up, um, yeah, it lit up, they, they, that they could see this event even though it was 23 degrees outside of their field of view. Um, but so they're much more sensitive right above them and they're not very sensitive to other things over there, but the signal leaked in anyway. Um, and an experiment called STAIR-2, uh, which is basically just a six inch pipe uh, capped with two literal cake pans. Um, and that was a pretty strong signal for STAIR-2. And you can see the radio bursts here. STAIR-2 saw one burst, uh, but CHIME saw two bursts. And the STAIR-2 burst uh, was identified as the high frequency component of the CHIME burst. And this event was so bright that you probably, if you like really looked at your cell phone data and knew where to look and processed it in the right way, you probably could have seen this burst with your cell phone, even though it occurred halfway across the galaxy. Uh, however, and this, this amount of energy uh, is pretty comparable to the energies that we expect for extragalactic fast radio bursts. Although in, on, on the scale of fast radio bursts, it was a bit weaker. Uh, there was also an X-ray burst, which adds to the excitement of this um, event. And you can see that the two bursts happen pretty close in time to these peaks in the X-ray light curve. Uh, and this X-ray burst was seen by four different X-ray telescopes at the same time, uh, thanks to that forest of bursts that was announced the day earlier. So we got really good information on it. Um, so is this actually a fast radio burst? Uh, well, it could have been seen at extragalactic distances, which is what a fast radio burst is. The Milky Way is similar to some of the fast radio bursts, the host galaxies of fast radio bursts. Uh, and the environment within the Milky Way, we think that this magnetar is in a spiral arm of our galaxy. Um, and that is similar to some of the fast radio bursts that we know about. And the, how often these events from like the one from this magnetar happen is also consistent with how often FRBs happen in the universe. Uh, so I think that creates a pretty compelling story that uh, some, perhaps most, fast radio bursts are produced by uh, magnetars like those in the Milky Way. But there are some open questions. This isn't the end of the story. Uh, for example, uh, do all fast radio bursts repeat? Uh, you can look at one fast radio burst and see 10 bursts in an hour, uh, but you stare at another for months and you don't see anything. Um, but maybe they just repeat on year timescales or every decade or so. Why do some fast radio bursts repeat more than others? Um, yeah, why, why do we observe that? Um, and we don't really know how these magnetars make fast radio bursts, although we have some ideas. Um, and uh, there also could be other things that contribute to the fast radio bursts that we see at extragalactic distances. Uh, yeah, and that's where I will stop. Thank you very much, Chris, for, for an excellent talk. I have to say, FRBs are, are very far afield from me. So you just about you know, quadrupled the amount that I know. This is really cool stuff. Uh, and congratulations on the very exciting result. This is great. Yeah, um, it was super amazing. And, and congratulations on the nature paper. That was awesome, dude. Yeah, this is great. Um, our ever perspicacious uh, Astronomy on Tap audience, they have a bunch of good questions, some of which were the same questions I was uh, asking myself during the talk. So I'm going to combine two of them, which are which are kind of related. So one uh, asks, "What is it?" So you, when you talked at the very beginning um, about the uh, different frequencies of light arriving at different times, so one person asked, "What is it about these these ionized clouds, these these electron clouds, that causes the dispersion of the different photons?" And then a follow up. Um, do we see differentiation of light as a function of wavelength for other astrophysical phenomena as well? 
Yeah, so the kind of boring answer is, let's see, how do I explain this intuitively? Uh, Yeah, and it's okay if it's not intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, the really boring answer is that you solve Maxwell's equations and it uh, this and you solve for the propagation speed and it pops out. Um, another way of thinking about it is that the different frequency of light. Um, that they, they're interacting with the electrons. Uh, so the electrons are kind of pulling on the light wave, which slows it down. And uh, the, you can pull a bit longer if the wavelength of the light is longer. So that would slow down uh, the light waves. And what was the follow-up question? Uh, and then do we see this kind of uh, differentiation as a function of wavelength for, for other astrophysical phenomena? Yeah, we actually do. Actually, there's another type of phenomenon in the radio, um, which is uh, uh, from the sun, actually. Uh, the sun undergoes radio flares, and they also have dispersed pulses. But it's not because there are electrons between us and the sun, uh, but rather that the emission physics of what's powering that just uh, emits uh, the high frequencies first and then emits the low frequencies. And that's part of why it could have fast radio bursts still could have been a galactic phenomenon is that uh, maybe there was something like what solar bursts do producing these really powerful solar flares, but within our galaxy. And that would explain why we think there would need to be so many electrons between us and the source. Mm, okay. Is, is it, is this too naive? Can I think of it as that the, the longer wavelengths of light uh, the redder wavelengths, just by virtue of the longer wavelength, have kind of a, a higher effective cross-section, and so that's part of why they're interacting more, or is that too simplistic for, for this dispersion? It's a bit simplistic, but um, I think it's close enough. <laughs> hey, I'll take it. For, for a Monday night in 2020, I'll take it. Uh, thank you. That's a, those, are, those are tough questions. Uh, so another question, uh, do you have any personal hypotheses about the, the wow signal from 1977? So this was a signal um, from a telescope called the Big Ear out in Ohio, um, and it's called the wow signal. I remember studying this in grad school because I don't know if it was an astronomer or a technician at the time actually literally wrote wow uh, next to the signal on the piece of paper. Yeah, I can't say that I know too much about um, that signal, but um, I guess it would have been really nice if it was seen from, like we could get a lot more information about it if it was seen with a collection of many dishes tied together that could localize it a bit better. And you can actually see if it's coming from nearby or far away mm -hmm. um, with that. But um, being uneducated about this particular burst, I'm always going to say it's humans first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the data reduction answer of. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so somebody else asked, and I, I noticed this as well, and, and had this question too. Um, on your slide, where you had a bunch of possible hypotheses for these FRBs back when they outnumbered the number of detected FRBs, um, I think it was in the bottom right. There was a blitzar. What was a blitzar? And is that one? Is that one sound? Is that one legit? Or is that was that one mixed? Blitzars are very cool. Uh, so there, what happens, so uh, at the end of the lives of very big stars, um, basically they run out of support for their cores um, and blow up. And what's left in that explosion uh, is that the, the core of that massive, massive star collapses into a neutron star uh, for blitzars in particular, uh, like uh, magnetars and pulsars, um, but it's a pretty massive neutron star. Uh, and it's spinning rapidly. Um, and basically it's only able to support itself as a neutron star because it's spinning rapidly. Um, and 
eventually it spins down and loses that support from the spinning uh, and collapses into a black hole. And the Blitzar is the moment when this proto-neutron star spins down enough that it can't support itself anymore and collapses it into a black hole. Um, very cool thing. Uh, it could still, I, it, it's really difficult. I think it's really difficult for something like that to make a fast radio burst uh, for two reasons. One of which is that uh, in that explosion and it's spinning down, um, the, there's a lot of mass ejected from the system that's still relatively close by. And when you have a lot of mass like that around a radio signal, it could quench it pretty easily. So it, the, the radio emission might be emitted, but it also would never reach us. It would just be absorbed in that cloud. Um, and uh, the second concern is that these Blitzar type events are likely very rare, um, but fast radio bursts are a very common phenomenon. So if it was going to make fast radio bursts, it could only make up a minority of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are we, these... Uh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, I was just going to ask, are, um, are there electromagnetic signatures of these objects that have been detected? No, uh, there are not. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that would look like as an electromagnetic signature. It might be pretty quiet. Mm -hmm. But presumably it would be a super high frequency uh, pulsar, like lower than millisecond pulsar because it's spinning up or because it's such a high, because it's rotationally supported? Uh, it's probably, it probably doesn't have an extraordinary uh, spin period compared to other newly born neutron stars, but um, is on the higher mass side, which is why it needs oh, that. So it's right on like the edge of where it could be a stable neutron star or just collapse directly into a black hole. Mm -hmm. um, you got kind of a shout out from the chat. Somebody says you need to brag more that you built stair too. <laughs> uh, that is true. People, this is a big deal. He's a PhD student who wrote a nature, who built an instrument that discovered the primary evidence for why an ongoing question, basically what's producing fast radio bursts and did this as a PhD student, like Chris is legit. This is a big deal. Good job. Kind of, kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. Um, we have uh, another question. Uh, does density change? So you were talking about teaspoons of neutrons and pyramids of thousands of years ago. Does density change as one goes toward the center from the surface of a neutron star? Um, is the matter compressible in these objects? Yeah, so that's one of the big open questions in physics actually is how does neutron star matter behave? Uh, so we're, we're, we're relatively certain that like there's different uh, layers of the neutron star and it does get denser um, as you go further and further into the neutron star, but exactly how compressible it is, um, we still need more data and measurements of the mass and radius of different neutron stars would help a lot with that. Um, but there's a point at which you start, you keep going into a neutron star and all of our physics kind of breaks. Uh, we don't <laughs> really know, like once you get to some extreme density, we don't really know what happens. And that happens in the cores of neutron stars. And, and I guess presumably that's the, there's nothing that we could do in the lab that would be very useful for, for kind of studying that. I mean, if you want to squash together a thousand pyramids of Giza into a teaspoon, you can go ahead. I can't even do 10. <laughs> can't even do <laughs> um, So I'll ask, I will ask one of my, my own questions. So speaking of, you know, your, your big discovery and, and the stair to array, uh, can you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, what the idea behind stair to is uh, and, and what it allows that maybe other existing instruments don't allow or how it complements, you know, observational parameter space? Yeah, so this STAIR-2, the whole idea behind it was exactly to look for something like a galactic analog of a fast radio burst. So we kind of found exactly what we hoped. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Although we never really counted on seeing anything because that's such a wild idea. <laughs> um, and uh, the, so the, the trade-off we made was sensitivity for 
right, we, we got a lot of field of view so we could look at most of the sky at any one time, uh, but we traded uh, the sensitivity uh, basically where not terribly much more sensitive than your cell phone, um, which means you're, you can only see extremely bright events, but you're a lot, but if there is such a bright event, you're likely to be looking at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And we were, um, and this, uh, this event occurred comfortably within our field of view and the chime telescope, which was built to study these, uh, distant fast radio bursts. Uh, it happened far outside of their field of view and they had to do a bit of extra work to figure out how bright it actually was. Mm -hmm. um, so how that's- How lucky did you get? How frequent are these events in our yeah, galaxy? Just, yeah, you know your field of view, you know how long it's been running, do we have a rate? <laughs> yeah, uh, so based off of this detection, there's about three of these events per year in the galaxy. Uh, if, I had, if, I, if I was a betting man, I would bet that the real rate is a bit lower than that. Um, and yeah, um, other than that, we don't really know too much. This is like, this, like this is, we're, we're, we're extrapolating this off of one event. It could happen once a decade. It could happen, um, a few times a year, um, uh, but it probably doesn't happen more than a few times a year. Does this mean for your next grant proposal, you have to increase the cake pan budget allocation? The what? The cake pan budget allocation. Absolutely. We might even get an oven and some flour. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, thanks again. This is this is super exciting. I'm glad you uh, you know, on your, your whirlwind tour, you made a stop by AOTLA to tell us about this. This is really great. So thanks again, Chris. I'm happy to do it. Uh, and if if Chris, if you and Briley, if you want to come back and stay on, we're we're inching toward the infamous third half of Astronomy on Tap. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share screen here. Sometimes we have technical difficulties with this part, but let's see if it works. Hub trivia. Hub okay. trivia time. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. Let's see if this works. All right. Everybody see the title slide? Can you guys see the, uh, do you see the please open up a browser tab window? Great. All right, so uh, fans of the program know that uh, what we do is we use a site called Poll Everywhere or pollev.com to, to make the trivia interactive during these virtual AOT events. Um, so next to your YouTube live chat, either in a new tab or a whole new browser window, uh, please go ahead and bring up this URL, so pollev dot com slash AOTLA for Astron Tap LA. Uh, what we'll do is we're going to go through a series of 10 multiple choice questions, some of which are even related to some of the topics we heard about. Uh, some are related to other uh, astrophysical kind of questions and topics, and some are related to the news and something you might have read. Uh, and we're going to see how everybody does. Now, before we get started, uh, uh, hopefully, as with the election, this is an honor system, and so uh, no looking up answers. You know, this is what do you know offhand, no Googling. Everybody can Google. We're already on the internet. Uh, and let's go ahead and get started. So you should see uh, the first question. NASA spacecraft OSIRIS-REx recently collected material from Bennu which is what type of object? Um, and the options we have are extrasolar planet, asteroid, comet, dwarf planet, uh, or moon of Jupiter. And hopefully, are you guys seeing the results update in real time? Yes, seeing oh, great. update. All right, so it uh, seems to be- Split. Uh, seems to be split. People are not liking dwarf planet or extrasolar planet. Uh, the moon of Jupiter, an asteroid. Uh, and if, if you don't want to bring up a browser tab, that's absolutely okay. Feel free to type your, your uh, uh, 
uh, answers, your guesses, your estimates in the YouTube chat. And we'll also try to give a shout out to those. We'll note that you don't have to sign up for anything to, to do this though. You just go to a website and type in your answer. So I think we have- It looks like it's kind of uniformly distributed and not changing. Yeah, I think, I think we've converged. So a little bit more than 80% said asteroid. Can oh, really? I, Chris? I'm not, I'm not seeing on, on what you're on the slide you're showing. I just see it uniformly divided into five different pies. No, so it looks like it's not updating in live. Let me, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Go ahead and talk amongst yourself for a couple minutes. I'll I like it. talking. <laughs> let's, let's Are we talk. allowed to play or do we have too much insider information? Oh, no, you can, play. you can play. You can play. <laughs> um, All right, yeah, give me one. Yeah, this was cool. This, uh, did people see the the news stories or the or the video about this? It's pretty exciting. I saw some pretty good memes about it too. Oh really? Oh, I didn't see mm -hmm. it. I'm pretty ignorant. Just have to spend more on time on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. You just have to spend all the time on Twitter to get all the good science memes. Is this how you win at um, Astronomy on Tap Pub trivia? As you spend your time on Twitter. <laughs> I, I try and spend as little time as possible on, on Twitter and astronomy on tap pub trivia myself. <laughs> um, let's see, what, what's what's working, Kaylin? We well, yeah. we also we had to move all of our questions to multiple choice, um, unfortunately, because we have no ability to moderate responses. So if you guys said like, poopy or curse words, it would show up. And we don't want that to show up. I mean, so. Cameron, I would appreciate it if you did not say poopy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like I didn't sign a waiver for this. Yeah. But we're, we're, we're trying to uh, get a version that uh, where we can moderate the responses. Yeah, we kind of always have a little bit of trouble with this. All right, uh, let's try one more time and see if this works. Well, you're Revealing other questions. Oh, okay, this looks good. This and looks better. Good. All right, so hopefully that just works. All right, so you, you can see the colored bar chart. Okay, yes. It looks like it's updated appropriately. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so it seems that we, we have converged. Most people, uh, a little bit over 80%, said asteroid. That is correct, incorrect. Chris, Cameron, Riley, what, what do you think? What's the peanut gallery? Well, I don't think it's extrasolar planet. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy that nobody in our audience chose that. That's, you know, we have a very astute, uh, very astute audience. So yes, it is, it is asteroid. So here is a, uh, this is an actual video uh, taken from uh, OSIRIS-REx. I can't remember actually what the acronym is. It's pretty tortured. And so this is a tag. This is a touch and go maneuver. So this was on October 20th. What is that? Six days ago. Um, and it came down, the way it works is you've got this, this arm here and the kind of cloud that you see, it's not that uh, the spacecraft is actually impacting the surface. What's happening is it, it emits this puff of nitrogen gas to just kick up a little kind of cloud, a little dust storm of rocks and debris. And, the, uh, and it, it gets them in. What's really cool, so the, the asteroid Bennu, it's about 18 light minutes away from the earth. And so that's long enough, you know, 18 minutes is a lot longer uh, than six seconds. And so the, the team kind of sent like a blueprint of instructions and then, you know, the onboard software kind of had to, to figure it out. And so the, the spacecraft was really doing a lot of this, um, you know, of its own volition. And the site that we're seeing where the, the material is actually collected from is within three feet of the original targeted site, which should be mind blowing for a human spacecraft that's, that's 18 light minutes away right now. Um, and I think I read, I don't know if y'all can confirm this, that it actually, they were looking for about three ounces to get uh, maybe about 80 grams. And I read somewhere, but I hadn't followed up on it, that they got so much that actually like the little bay door was having trouble like closing and that it was actually like leaking material. Is that true? 
Friday, I see you, you're, you're nodding. Yeah, I mean, I saw things about that too. I also didn't follow up on it yet, but I've, I've seen news about that. Apparently they're like trying to work to get it fully closed so that they don't leak too much of the sample now. <laughs> yeah, it would be such a bummer. The, the initial quote from somebody on the team was, was we literally crushed it. And then they learned, you know, within 24 hours that maybe crushing it had some, some deleterious effects on the sample. Um, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully we'll get, we'll get something, something back from it. I think they had the, the kind of, you know, little box that they're, they're putting everything in had room for up to four pounds of material. So somewhere in between 80 grams and four pounds, hopefully we still get that amount. All right. Uh, question number two. And let me know if you don't see this update in real time, but hopefully you do. Yeah. So UCLA professor uh, Andrea Ghez was recently awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of what at the center of our Milky Way galaxy? So we have habitable Earth-like exoplanet, uh, dwarf galaxy cluster, supermassive black hole, or gamma ray burst. So this was uh, one of the, the kind of new you know, discovery. The discovery itself is not new, but one of the uh, uh, you know, new things that I was alluding to uh, earlier. So are y'all seeing the- No, it's not updating. Well, shoot. OK, uh, let's just- Start let's just... the presentation to see live content. Yeah, I think that Paul Ev has really changed the way that they're doing things. So maybe it's only working on this side. Mm. Um, real time. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you know very rough estimates. We have about 80% of people coming in uh, a supermassive black hole. Nobody has said dwarf galaxy cluster. Uh, there's a little bit for a habitable Earth-like exoplanet um, and a little bit of love for gamma ray burst. Uh, the answer, does anybody know? I'll bet everybody here should know. Yes. In particular, Briley. Briley's at UCLA, <laughs> where Andrea Gez is a professor. Yeah, I have to know. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, have you, uh, have there been like conference calls or anything, you know, with, with her as Nobel laureate within the department since? Yeah, we had a really fun, you know, like celebration toast because we couldn't do it in person over Zoom uh, the day it was announced, which was nice. Oh, that's that's cool. The most people I've seen on a Zoom call so far. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, have you taken any classes with Andrea? I haven't actually. Mm -mm. Uh, so yeah, the answer is, uh, it is a supermassive black hole. So this is, let's see if this works. Uh, little animation. So this oh, is actually that. from, from uh, uh, Professor Gez's uh, Galactic Center group. You see down there in the, the UCLA group. So one of the, the many, kind of the hallmark of her discovery and what we're watching here is in yellow, that's the orbit of a star that's called S02. Um, and we're looking at uh, just about, maybe a little bit over 20 years of data uh, of, of positional data, or astrometric data. And they know that the mass of this star is about 10 to 15 times the mass of the sun. So it's, uh, it's a, a little bit bigger, a little bit more massive. And they actually mapped out a full orbit. So it only took a little bit over 16 years for this star to go you know, full oval, full orbit. Um, and from knowing the mass of the star, knowing the period of its orbit and being able to measure how far away it is from, from the object it's, it's orbiting, you can apply uh, Kepler's laws and actually estimate the mass of the object uh, you know, marked by that white star there. They figured out that it's something that is more than a million times the mass of the sun, so something extraordinarily huge. And this was one of the uh, um, really kind of concrete pieces of evidence that there's a supermassive black hole. Uh, in the middle of the galaxy. And you can see that, that it wasn't just this object. There's a bunch of, uh, of other stars for which they're tracking um, astrometric orbit data as well. Uh, and yeah, the announcement, it was just like a week ago, right? Yeah, uh, two weeks ago? I think it might have been two weeks, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it was... So something that I thought was really fun was everyone always sees this version of the plot because it's, you know, the newest one. But when I was writing about Andrea's Nobel for Astrobytes, I was like, well, they had to have published all this data like 
before. They didn't, weren't going to wait 16 years. They probably <laughs> published just a bit earlier. So I went and looked through the papers and in, in this astrobite, I like took basically this plot from each of the papers to show how it changed over time as they added more data. And it oh. looked really cool. Like it was fun to see like the, you know, 1990 something picture compared to this animation. That's cool. I mean, I remember, this will date myself a little bit, but, uh, and, and I'm not even joking. I remember uh, in the 90s being a very young kid, you know, and, and PBS or something was on. And, and I, I just, she was the first astrophysicist, maybe after Carl Sagan, whose like name I actually knew. Um, Cause she was there talking about, uh, talking about the galactic center. Uh, so it's, it's very, very cool to have, you know, a colleague of ours in LA uh, at UCLA with Riley, you know, be awarded for some, some pretty awesome science. Well, and just, just to make it clear to the audience, the, the trajectories of the stars indicate that there's a really massive object in the center and that massive object doesn't have an electromagnetic counterpart. We we don't see it in visible light. We don't see it in uh, visible light. We don't see it in space visible light. We don't it's see it in visible light. I'm gonna. I would punch you through the screen, but I can't make my fist go through the screen. Um, I didn't study invisible light. But the point is. Uh, it was confined to a small enough space that was massive enough that there was no other explanation for how to compress mass down to that size scale and have it also be invisible. And so that, that's why it is inferred that it's a, a black hole, essentially. That's, that's the reason for the, for the discovery that was yeah. shared between her and primarily between her and Reinhard Genzel for this discovery. Um, and then additionally with um, Penrose? Yeah, Roger Penrose for his other work on black, like theoretical explanation for black holes. Yeah, that's a good point. Not just massive, massive and dark. Right. All right, question three. Uh, and apologies for the technical difficulties. It looks that Poly B is not playing nicely, but that's okay. So uh, of the estimated 1 million pieces of space debris around the earth, approximately how many are being tracked and cataloged? So 10,000, about 1%, 20,000, 2%, 5%, 10%, 20%, or 50%. It's not looking good when the highest answer is half. The the kind of punchline of this question is that tracking space debris is hard, and we're not very good at it, and we're making more of it. But we are getting better at estimating how bad we are at cataloging and tracking it. Uh, so what we're seeing is most people, uh, there's kind of a, a two-way tie between maybe 1% and 2%, about a quarter of respondents for each. Uh, oh, and maybe a, a three-way tie with, with 200,000 or 20%. So- Wait, so uh, what, what's the main, the main focus? Is it the high end or the low end? Uh, it's bimodal. It's bimodal. Oh. Interesting. Yeah, nobody thinks it's 5%. Okay. Uh, and the, the correct answer, so it is about uh, 2%, uh, 2%. So there's something like 20,700 um, satellites. So that's, that's not debris or fragments from, from collisions or anything, uh, but those are objects you would still need to track if you're, if you're putting up a new object. Uh, all of these have come up since uh, Sputnik 1 was launched. So that was in, in October, I think, 1957. Um, and there was a new study by a group, I forget the name of the telescope that they were using, uh, but they started, uh, what they do is they turn off equatorial tracking. Uh, and so that means that all of the stars in the, in the, in the night sky are gonna, like they're gonna leave star trails. And if you're tracking anything that's in uh, geosync orbit, it's going to remain fixed. Uh, and they, they put an estimate of about 1 million pieces of human-made satellites that are still operational, but also pieces of, of debris and fragments. And this is just a uh, kind of a, a the snapshot of a simulation showing um, the spatial distribution. So you can see uh, most of it is in very low Earth orbit. Uh, kind of around the earth. And this is objects that are bigger than about one centimeter in size. So there's a lot of junk out there. Uh, and I think I was reading that if there's no mitigation, you know, people have talked about everything from 
Well, the crazy thing I was reading about, I think it was like a space vacuum for setting something up there that just goes and sucks these up. Um, I don't think that's going to get very much traction. No. Uh, but, you know, this is only going to get worse. Um, so, you know, prospects are great. <laughs> this is a, a 20. Yeah, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. It's not a clear solution. Big net, big space craft with a net. Yeah, the space net that's just, you know, that's just dense enough to capture all the Starlink satellites. <laughs> yeah. All right, next question. Uh, so this is a uh, shout out to Chris's talk. Uh, so in 2007, Duncan Lorimer used archival data from the park's radio dish in Australia to discover the first example of what astronomical phenomenon. So we've got type two supernova, coronal mass ejection, um, extra galactic aurora and fast radio burst. Uh, so I, what we're seeing over here, I feel like I'm Wolf Blitzer and I don't have my beard sling or my like, you know, big, you know, board that I can show everybody. But what we're seeing is there's a little bit of answers coming in with probably 50% of precincts reporting for coronal mass ejections and type two supernovae. Um, but thankfully it looks like about 85% of attendees and respondents were paying attention uh, and it is, drum roll please, fast radio burst. Uh, so Chris, maybe if you want to explain uh, the image that's being shown here. Yeah, uh, so this is um, a German instrumental uh, rock band uh, that is named Lorimer Burst after uh, this event. Um, and they have a description of themselves, uh, which is, uh, I really like this description. Uh, yeah, it was great when you sent it to us earlier. <laughs> and I'll just note that uh, I didn't even coerce Chris into talking about prog rock, uh, given last month's Yeah, what was it? Yes, that was the prog rock theme. Yeah, the great English prog rock band, yes, of the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2000 teens, and today. Okay, okay. I'm glad to help you out. Uh, <laughs> I, when you, I was stoked, this is great. <laughs> yeah, so they describe themselves as Lorimer Burst music is as mysterious and fascinating as the fast radio burst. Touching melodies, extremely powerful at some points, the listener will be put into orbit for a memorable journey. <laughs> Have you listened uh, to the music? Is it is it any good? I would say it's pretty mysterious. Um, I don't know <laughs> if I got to orbit. Uh, yeah, would you say it's far out? Far out is a fair word. Yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> I mean, Cameron, we'll put it like this: it's no yes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right. Thank you, uh, Chris, very much. I hope I hope you mentioned that quote. You know, in your your job talk circuit. I think that could only boost you. Yeah, I'm sure they'll throw offers to me after that. <laughs> they'll, they'll throw something at you after. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, next question. So we've got, uh, this is question five. The joint ESA-JAXA spacecraft, Beppe Colombo, recently flew by what object to get a gravity boost and also study its atmosphere? Uh, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, and yeah, it's kind of too bad that you guys can't see this, but there's the, the pie chart, like people are taking competing bites, of competing colors. So, so far we've, we, most people are saying Venus. Um, there's some Uranus, there's some Jupiter. Uh, I thought about putting in a planet, a solar system planet um, that's not, one of these, maybe Earth as a curveball, but I mean, one attempt to. So, with 90% of precincts, we're getting a, an overwhelming favorite, uh, Venus. Uh, and Venus is correct. So, here, this is, a, this is an artist's conception, I should say. This is not actual data. Um, so, the Beppe Colombo spacecraft, so it was launched uh, in October 2018. It's actually headed to Mercury. So, you know, we've spent a lot of time today talking about the outer solar system. Uh, Pluto and Eric Hoff and Charon, Karen, Sharon, I forget. Um, this is actually headed in, inward. 
Uh, and one or two astronomy on taps ago, we talked about a Japanese spacecraft called um, Akatsuki, probably mispronouncing that. Um, and it's been in orbit around Venus since 2015, and it's collected some great data uh, on the atmosphere of Venus. Um, but the Colombo, uh, it's, it's going very close to Venus. I think it's doing two quasi orbits. They're not closed, uh, but to get a gravity boost and propel itself to Mercury. Uh, and during these close approaches, it's actually going to be about 30 times closer to Venus than Akatsuki. Um, but it's not going to be as close for nearly as long. So it'll, it'll get you know, very high resolution close up data, but it's not going to have a kind of longitudinal time baseline um, that the Japanese uh, solar probe is getting. And uh, phosphine, this detection of phosphine was in the news maybe about five or six weeks ago. I can't remember. Um, and the, the team scientists for Beppe Colombo say that you know, their instruments were designed to study mercury, so they're actually not sure if they're going to be sensitive enough to, to confirm or disprove uh, uh, the phosphine detection. Uh, but we'll see. We'll stay tuned and see what kind of data uh, it reports back. All right, next question. So what galactic structure consisting of stars has recently been identified in our own Milky Way galaxy? Uh, the choices are flares, shells, streams, uh, and warps. Uh, so a lot of people are saying streams. And so that's about two thirds of respondents. We got uh, about one six for flares, one six for warps. Um, Nobody's really interested in shells. Let's see, is there anything coming in on the- uh, Nobody's interested in shells? Nobody's interested in shells. All right, now there's, it's, it's still, it's about 70% for, for streams and then equally split among the other three. I mean, there certainly are galactic streams and warps. Galactic flares, not so much. Galactic flares, not so much. But definitely I galactic shells. Definitely galactic shell. So yeah, uh, Cameron, I pulled, this is the, uh, the APOD picture, if you want to. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful image. So yeah, galactic shells look like this, as you can see, <laughs> uh, suggestive of, of some sort of weird, weird dynamical event that's going on in the interiors of these galaxies. Did you, did you pull the movie at all or did you get- Oh, I did not. I just, I just put in this. Okay. When yeah, so you can form these kinds of structures when you have a merger system where like another galaxy, usually a minor galaxy, a, a, a minor merger, so it's a lower mass galaxy, kind of falls into the potential of a galaxy and the stars from it pass through the center and, and form these is essentially, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to describe this without having a video, but essentially um, the stars will pass through and go out to a turnaround point and then kind of slow down as they reach that point and then come back kind of like a pendulum that goes, it spends the bulk of its time out at the extent of its, uh, of its reach because that's where it's the slowest. And it's the same thing here. And so you see an over density at these kind of extrema of the orbits of the stars and that forms these kind of shell like structures. And for the first time, uh, researchers, astronomers have discovered these sorts of structures in the Milky Way, indicative that there was some sort of merger, minor mergers with dwarf galaxies at some point in the past where you have stars sitting in these, these dynamical structures for a longer period of time. So it's pretty interesting and pretty exciting stuff, but we've been able to see these in, in, uh, in elliptical galaxies in particular uh, for a while now, but just not, not in our own galaxy. Cool, cool stuff. Yeah, this picture is beautiful. Do you remember what, did you say what object this is? Uh, no, I don't know off the top of my head which object this is. This is, but this is a, it's an elliptical galaxy. Um, ellipticals tend to have uh, more of a turbulent past with, with more mergers potentially wiping out their, their rotation, their net rotation and their angular momenta. So you tend to see shells more often in this kind of environment, but Evidently, this still occurs in in more passively evolving systems like like our Milky Way or other disk galaxies as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool, cool stuff. But the other answers on that, uh, as part of that multiple choice, streams, 
There are, we do see streams associated both with the Milky Way as well as many other galaxies. What were the other ones? Flares and? Uh, warps. Oh, warps. Yeah, warps are, are uh, gravitational events in the disk. And we, we do see warps associ uh, associated with the Milky Way and we do see streams like the Magellanic stream associated with the Milky Way. Galactic flares, I don't know if that's a thing. I think you just- <laughs> No, that was, a, that was a red herring. I see, okay. All right, uh, next question. Uh, so this is a, a throwback, a callback to our other uh, talk. So what are Pluto and all of its moons named after? So we have comic book villains, mythological gods of the underworld, as opposed to the very real gods of the underworld who are apparently on earth in 2020, former world leaders, Disney animated characters or uh, Dax, as they're known, that'll come in handy later. D A C. Dax. Uh, or subatomic, subatomic particles. Okay. Subatomic particles. So. Comic book villains. I like that one. Yeah. No one. No one's thinking comic book villains. <laughs> no one's thinking formal former world leaders. Maybe if I'd said future world leaders, that would have felt more appropriate for 2020. Well, that could also be comic book villains. You could have a a Joker, a Riddler, uh, Lex Luthor. No? Oh, those are the villains? Oh, I've been reading it wrong this whole time. <laughs> uh, so we have an, an overwhelming super, super majority uh, for mythological gods of the underworld. And so of course, had to had to put up, uh, you know, our favorite photo of Pluto. I guess I should have made the question harder. I could have asked what are all of the craters on Pluto named after, which I think is a little more tricky. Yeah, Do any let's of you ask know? our audience that. Oh yeah, I don't think Who I know. the craters named after? Is it also underworld related? It is not. So mm -hmm. all of, Pluto and all of its moons are named after gods of the underworld. All of the craters on Pluto and all like the geological features are named after explorers. So that's like Sputnik Planitia. Cool. Mm. Like, but then the really fun one is the features on Sharon are informally currently named after pop culture and sci-fi. <laughs> so the dark spot is called Mordor. Yes. Um, Mordor Macula. Yeah. Yes. And then um, there's some craters that are named like Luke and Leia. <laughs> Luke and Leia? They're Star Wars yeah. references? Yeah, so the IAU hasn't approved it yet, so it's not like official, but it's what people like have referred to them as and made maps of. That's awesome. So it's pop culture, science fiction, and also science fact, if it's named after Star Wars. Oh, God. <laughs> That's actually really cool. Are there, what, do you know other examples of Star Wars, or not Star Wars, <laughs> sci-fi popular, like popular culture references on Sharon? Um, I would have to look at the map. The ones that I always bring up for reference are the Star Wars ones and the Lord of the Rings ones, but I, there's there's that's more because cool. there's a lot more features. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. I did not know that. Uh, and can you remind me, I keep messing up, how do you say the most massive Pluto moon? Sharon? So you can say it, yeah, you can technically say, so Kara is what other people want, like what people want to say because that's how you actually say like the Greek god name, but the moon we say Sharon, and I don't know if this story is true, but the story I was always told was it's because the guy who named Sharon wanted to keep it in line with the gods of the underworld theme, but his wife was also named Sharon, so he made it the pronunciation <laughs> to match her. Uh -huh. I have no idea if that has fact, but it's what I've always been told of how to remember how to pronounce it, so Sharon. So it really does ring true then, Sharon is Karen. Oh, jeez, Kaylin, Kaylin, stop. Yeah, all right, next question. Keep this train moving. Number eight, uh, how many people, humans, have stood on our moons? This is Earth's moon. Uh, we were discussing the exciting news earlier. Uh, so in numerical order, the choices are 6, 12, 18, 24, and 30. Oh. So right now about, uh, or <laughs> I guess somebody can chime in on the YouTube chat if you think it's none of these numbers and you have your own <laughs> number that you, you want to suggest. We will not accept zero. We will not accept moon hoaxers. 
yeah, so. yeah that, this is this is not the chat you're looking for <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> uh all right so it, it's really kind of all over the place with a a slim plurality for 12 for a baker's dozen minus one or a, <laughs> as it's known to humans a dozen <laughs> Baker's dozen minus one. Really? That's the one that gets you? I'm I'm actually really disappointed. Uh, that's just ridiculous. It's just 12. It's just 12. All right. <laughs> uh, here we go. So the answer, uh, <laughs> Chris Briley, do y'all know the answer? I actually did not know the answer. I had to, I had to look this up. I did not know the answer. Um, I guessed 12 because I like answering B the best. <laughs> Is that B for Bohemic? No, it just looks aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, six, six successful Apollo missions, and each Apollo mission had three astronauts, and uh, but only two of them got to actually go down to the surface, and there was still one person hanging out in the uh, in the orbiting orbiting capsule that eventually you know making sure everything was okay so that eventually when the two people on the surface were like okay we're done here they could get back in their their limb and and shoot back up and and dock with the the main the main event up in orbit so six times two is 12. <laughs> Baker's dozen minus one and we probably everybody knows it's it's so the first one was Apollo 11 so we had Buzz and, and Armstrong uh and then it, it really was uh 12 14 15 16 17 17 was the last Apollo mission and that um uh was December of 1972 so it has been a hot minute since humans have been to yeah. and uh correct me if I'm wrong so it was Eugene Cernan and was it Harrison Schmidt? Was he on 17? Right. So Harrison Schmidt, the only professional scientist to land on the moon too. So he had a PhD in geology. And uh, whereas most of the astronauts who landed on the moon had backgrounds in piloting, experimental piloting, because a lot of this job was all about making sure you got there and got back. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Schmidt, you know, he he gets out and he's just like, oh yeah, this rocks. Yeah. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're almost, we're almost done with this train. All right, question nine. I, this is true, I'm an energetic atomic nucleus traveling through space at nearly the speed of light, launched from an exploding star or a supermassive black hole. What am I? My neutrino, a quark, uh, a tuton, an astral traveler, Ooh, that's an interesting one, uh, or a cosmic ray. All right, so we're seeing a, a cosmic ray and neutrino are getting, getting a lot of answers. All right, it's, it's mostly cosmic ray. Quark, a little bit. Tuton, a little bit. Uh, astral traveler. Oh, Astro Traveler, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Uh, so I'll just say, you know, as, as people are, are continuing to answer, um, I don't know how many people said Teuton, uh, but let me read you the first. Is, isn't Teuton, two, isn't that like Germanic Knights? From yeah, the, 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 two, the first two sentences, I was very proud of this answer. The first two sentences of the Wikipedia article on Teutons are, the Teutons were an ancient tribe mentioned by Roman authors. They are generally classified as a Germanic tribe. So it is not a Teuton, though I, I thought that might sound like a particle. <laughs> uh, like particle. The answer is Cosmic Ray. And so here we have the cover art, the alternative cover art from Yes, Time and Word. Uh, and we, of course, remember that track seven from side two of this, which is the second studio album by the English prog rock band Yes released on 24th July, 1970, uh, in between the band's eponymous debut album, and perhaps a little confusingly, the Yes album, uh, track seven is Astral Traveler. Uh, why are you showing B-sides to B-bands in an astronomy? This is, A, this is not a B-band. So this song, uh, Astral Traveler, uh, it was written by John Anderson, who's the, the front man, the lead singer, primary songwriter, 
uh, of Yes. And this, as I mentioned, this is actually the alternative album art. So this is not what you would have gotten in the UK. Um, but this one more prominently features Steve Howe, uh, the guitarist. Uh, he's the one on the right in the red shirt. Um, so Cosmic Ray it was. Good job. Yeah, cosmic Ray. <laughs> cosmic Ray. You didn't, you didn't think we were going to let Yes sit this one out. Uh. All right. Cosmic, cosmic rays. Wait, first, <laughs> let's talk about cosmic rays and not just a prog rock band. <laughs> cosmic uh, rays are super exciting. And, 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 uh, <laughs> lots of my colleagues are, are, are working on this to, to understand a bunch of the dynamics of the gas in the outer parts of galaxies. But these things come off of, uh, supermassive black holes in the interior of galaxies. They come off of supernovae. They get accelerated. These um, high energy protons and, and nuclei get accelerated to these super, super high velocities. And it has nothing to do with the crummy prog rock band. You, you watch it. <laughs> uh, we have uh, uh, some answers in the chat that are going on. So Piper Tripp says, yes, is A grade. EC says, I've got to thank you for introducing me to yes. Last time I've been enjoying No! Oh, God, no. Oh, uh, Cameron, looks like uh, somebody's, in, uh, somebody's in hot water here. Uh, so remember that Astral Traveler. I, this isn't actually even in my top four favorite <laughs> Yes albums, but if you've got time, Sweet Dreams is really nice. No. <laughs> All right, question. <laughs> Question 10, thanks to the 17 people who stuck around. So in the documentaries of the Star Wars, what is the home planet of Admiral Akbar and other members of his squid-like species? Ooh. DAC, I did mention Disney animated characters that that acronym would come in handy. Um, Kashyyyk, Sheriff, <laughs> uh, Wobani. Uh, Dak Kashyyyk. Don't listen to his suggestions. It's a trap. It's a trap. It's so a trap. I will note that these are all uh, actual planets in the Star Wars galaxy, um, which is, as we noted, an actual galaxy. Um, Vobani and Scarif were featured, I believe it was in Rogue One. Uh, I think Scarif might have even been the, the opening planet. So if you think back to the opening scene of Rogue One, if you did not see Mon Calamari and you answered Scarif, you might be in trouble. So what we're seeing is a little bit more than 50% for Dak, about a quarter for Wobani, remainder for Scarif, uh, and no Kashyyyk love. I'm assuming that's because our very intelligent AOT audience knows that Kashyyyk is the home planet of the Wookie. Wookiees. Wookiees. All right. So here we have, uh, this is actual data uh, taken a long time ago in this far, far away galaxy of the planet DAC. Uh, the planet. So I learned in looking at Wikipedia, um, the Wikipedia for the documentaries of the Star Wars, uh, this planet is known as, also known as Mon Calamari or Calamari or Mon, Mon Cala. It's a planet in the Calamari system of the Calamari sector, sector uh, of the Outer Rim. And it's actually home to, to multiple sentient species, or at least it was before. Um, before it was eradicated. It's, uh, multiple sentient species. So there's also the Quorum, the Moapa, the Amphihydrus, and the Whaladons, in addition to um, the Mont Calamari. I see. So yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for bearing through the trivia. We're, we're gonna switch to a different program the next time around. We think we found a, a better alternative that uh, will get rid of some of these buggy interactive features. It'll be a little bit smoother. Um, if we could, we'll do another round of applause. Thank you very much, uh, Briley and Chris, for giving your time and your expertise. Uh, great job. I learned a lot. Cameron sure as hell learned a lot about yes and about Lorimer Burst. Those were, those were excellent, excellent presentations. The prog rock references that Kaylin keeps dipping in here may be less excellent. But um, no, but also maybe not maybe as excellent. <laughs> there's room. Chris, have you listened to Lorimer Burst, this German band that's named after FRBs? Only a little bit. Um, yeah, this 
this band was discovered. Uh, we had a conference in July um, about fast radio bursts at which uh, the community discovered this band. Oh, I was hoping Lorimer Burst showed up at the conference. <laughs> Maybe next time. Uh, now yeah. we're aware of them. We can get them next year. Yeah, you probably can. I mean, you probably can. An, an old B-rated prog rock band. You could probably get Yes to go, to be honest. All right, you're on thin ice there. <laughs> Maybe we could get Yes. We could get Yes to come to Astronomy on Tap LA. <laughs> what, are yeah, they, what else yeah, are they doing? Yeah. But but Laura Maverse, the Laura Maverse was only discovered in 2007, right? So Laura Maverse can't be that old, at least not compared to, to Yes or to Kim. No, I think um, uh, they're only a couple years old. Well, well, well. They're probably still on the rise, unlike Yes, who is in the middle of a broad crest <laughs> of popularity and expertise. I bet you could get them to like sign some stuff, Chris. If you just like, I think there's some synergy that can be worked out. There is. I mean, they can get a signature from Duncan Lorimer. Duncan Lorimer gets a signature from Lorimer Burst. It works out <laughs> in the end. <laughs> oh, there's an excellent question in the in the chat. Is it about Why you? do the planets in the Star in Star Wars always have uh, single ecosystems, single climates? And that <laughs> is writers for the Disney and and for the Star Wars franchise are not creative. Uh, not good. Not good. You'll also notice if you go to Wikipedia, Dagobah, Desert World, Tatooine, Ice World, Hoth. It's really a shame and yeah. not very realistic. And, and if you go to Wikipedia, you'll you'll find that most of their orbital periods are about 365 days. Most of their rotational <laughs> periods are about 24 hours. Most of their radii are about one Earth radii. Most of the stars that they orbit are about you know G yeah. worlds. It's not great. Yes. It's like real exoplanets, right? <laughs> um, but related to that, I think in December, we are going to have an astronomy on tap, either December or January, that uh, is one talk will be astron uh, the, the science of Star Trek, and one Ooh. talk will be the science of Star Wars. Ooh. We finally have it out and a battle between the science of these worlds. And hopefully there will not be any prog rock bands that are mentioned as part of this whole experience but i don't know i don't know why you would hope for something that a is not good and b it's not gonna happen <laughs> i think you're digging uh, your own grave here cameron no, i it it seems that way i think i'm outnumbered in terms of love of prog rock oh yeah emphatically i say yes <laughs> <laughs> No dream theater. I haven't noticed any dream theater yet, though. So. Well, no, we haven't. We, we've, we're only on studio album two. <laughs> um, yes. Um, all right. Well, thank you both uh, of our speakers, uh, Bradley Lewis, Chris Bohenick. Much appreciated. Rising stars in the field of astronomy and astrophysics. Stay, stay tuned for more from them. Uh, and in case you missed the beginning, Lots of Astronomy on Tap events, not just ours, which are awesome, hopefully you think so, but also uh, Briley is involved in a new group close to UCLA in Westwood, Brentwood, west side of Los Angeles, that will have their first event in a, potentially a couple of weeks. Uh, so stay tuned, look on Twitter on AOT West LA, I believe is the Twitter handle, yes. Um, but if you go to astronomyontap.org, it not only lists our events, their events, but all of the events that are going on with the, within Astronomy on Tap at various different chapters, whether it be in the US, whether it be in Europe, whether it be in Asia, and, and all of them are virtual right now for the most part. So lots of live streams of various different, different uh, Astronomy on Tap events like this. Our next Astronomy on Tap is, I think, set for mid-November. Yeah, I think it's the 14th. Uh, sorry, 16th, 16th. 16th. I think it's potentially going to be the 16th. We also have an event, a stargazing lecture that uh, will be, our speaker will be uh, Katie Bauman of Imaging a Black Hole for the First Time fame. So that will be cool a week from Friday, November 6th. So go to our website, outreach.astro.caltech.edu for more information about that. And... And vote. Don't forget to vote. Go Don't, vote. Uh, 
Oh, and come by, come by and say hi at the Altadena Senior Center or at the uh, or at Park. Park. I will be there for this Friday, this Friday, wow, this Friday, next Monday and next Tuesday. So if you want to vote, vote with me or with, or with that guy. Yeah, yeah, Friday, Monday, Tuesday as well. Stop on by, say hi, talk about yes. Yeah, don't. don't talk about <laughs> you won't get him to shut up. Uh, thanks everybody for coming and... We hope you have a great evening and stay safe and wear a mask. We're not wearing masks, but I'm not around anybody. I'm just drinking beer. So <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye, everybody.